Uh, all right. So we can see it now. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes. So one thing maybe for the discussion afterwards is if you can add the questions that you have to the live notes. Uh, now the workbook has been duplicated to the live notes so that we can go in order uh, later. Thanks. Okay, so first of all, thank you for Graeme for, and the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. Um, I would talk about uh, the experience of uh, trying to port uh, the simulation code uh, to uh, take advantage of new hardware. Um, okay, so we all know the challenge that we have ahead of us. Um, we'll have an enormous uh, leap in data volume and computing requirements. And here we have the latest uh, image for the, the plan to the Helminos LHC. And the next few years are very crucial to prepare software for Run3 and beyond. Of course, that we have a little problem here that will delay things probably. And uh, in a sense, it would give us a bit more time to prepare the software. but. Uh, Probably not much. Um, so here is a slide from a talk given by Vitek uh, Pekorski at the uh, LHCC, uh, Junt for a Strategy for L High Luminosity LHC. And um, here we can see uh, each experiment and the big challenges that we have. I think from this slide, the, uh, the most critical is LHCB, where from the plot, it's uh, clear that unless a lot of fast simulation is used, it's very difficult to uh, stay under the pledgeable amount of CPU resources that will be required. Um, Alice also uses a lot of time for simulation. It's a very big portion uh, of their computing budget. For CMS, uh, although the share of simulation is not expected to increase compared to now, since the whole volume of everything is uh, increasing a lot uh, around 2026 when uh, was initially planned for the HLHC. Um, we need to uh, prepare uh, our software for, we need to optimize the uh, simulation as well. So Atlas uh, also has a big part of uh, Monte Carlo and full simulation always will be required. So. Um, as much as we may think that you know we can use fast simulation to uh, get down the amount of CPU that we will need, uh, we will always need at least part of uh, full simulated data. Um, so one project that was created started early in the last decade is the GNV project uh, to address this challenge for simulation. So here in the first bullet, I put two links, one of the initial talks proposing the, the project. And the other one is a paper that, with the final conclusions. The project ended last year. And this paper has results, it's published in the archive um, from this uh, endeavor. And the aim of the project was to better exploit hardware parallelism for simulation. We know that John Four. You know, the code is showing its age a little bit. It's uh, more than 20 years old. And the idea was to make use of uh, vector registers on CPUs. So the, the project was uh, funded by Intel uh, and take advantage of, at the time, you know, when the project started, uh, here you have the hardware landscape. Intel was betting big on the Xeon Phi with the many cores. Um, Although there were some problems with portability, uh, the KNC was not fully compatible with uh, x86-64. Uh, so the, the idea was to exploit, uh, exploit the hardware to the fullest and using vectorization because for the Xeon Phi, this was a key part of achieving the top performance. So unless, uh, because the cores, the frequency was much lower and the cores were much simpler, unless uh, vectorization was used, it was very hard to get top performance on the platform. Uh, the, the project was also investigating uh, using GPUs for particle transport, but I think that due to the, to the you know, strong involvement with Intel, 
this was not the top priority uh, during the, the John V development. So the, the project started with many good ideas and identifying you know, the correct problems that we had in John 4. But of course, that simulation is not an easy thing. So it's a very complex uh, piece of code and we have many different physics models, lots of data um, and a lot of configurability that the experiments need to uh, simulate exactly what they, they want. So. Um, uh, in the meantime, like since the beginning of this project, the hardware landscape also changed a lot. So at the time, these are the top uh, uh, CPUs, more or less, and the top NVIDIA card. Um, one thing that you notice moving to now is that the cache on the CPU, so now we have AMD coming in big with Ryzen and uh, Intel now, you can see that in, even though Xeon Phi was discontinued, um, I think one weakness it had was that it only supported for KNC the full 512 bit width uh, for CMD. And if you didn't, uh, if you couldn't take advantage of the long vector, then it was difficult to get performance. I think this played into the, the downfall of uh, Xeon Phi. But now, you know, the Xeon Platinum. Uh, goes up to 56 cores, almost the same as the Xeon Phi. So in, in a sense it leaves, but you have AVX 512, uh, but you can also use uh, lower sizes of the register. So you can use SSC and, and so it's much more flexible to achieve performance in, the, in these new processors. The AMD processor tried to spend the registers, the, the transistors elsewhere. So it has a much bigger cache and only supports AVX2. And for, for simulation, this bigger cache uh, may play a, a big role in, in how the code performs on that processor. So this is something that later this year, uh, there will be a machine acquired with uh, these processors and we will study how to optimize simulation in, in this platform in particular. And of course that now, uh, since a couple of years ago, we have video cards with special hardware support for ray tracing and uh, ray tracing and uh, particle transport are two problems that share many parallels. So this is another avenue that we plan to investigate for the future. So this didn't exist when the Gen V project started. It's, uh, uh, and so it's some, not something that could have been planned uh, at that time, but it's certainly something that we should uh, take a look at if we want to uh, in improve uh, performance of simulation. So due, due to the strong involvement with Intel, here I link the two different Intel Parallel Computing Center projects that were supported by Intel to work on uh, Gen V. So it was a strong focus in CMD vectorization. Also because you know the Xeon Phi was the main target platform at the time. And if you didn't take uh, advantage of the long vectors, it was hard to get performance. So I joined the project at this point, uh, November of 2015, uh, through the second uh, parallel computing center project at Sao Paulo State University. So this is how I began my involvement with, uh, with HAP in general. I am a physicist, by, but before I was doing other things. Um, so um, but you know, since the very beginning, there were concerns with portability, and within VecGeom, uh, there were backends that could dispatch algorithms for the different geometry shapes to either a scalar algorithm or a vectorized algorithm, and there was also support in annotations on uh, for CUDA support in the code. Uh, so, and there was also this intermediate project, USolids from Aida. Uh, and then the VecGeom and USolids were merged into a single project. Now USolids don't exist anymore. But the, the, the important part is that out of this uh, experience, uh, we learned that we needed some layer to abstract uh, the um, uh, calls to vector code. And this is when VecCore was created and this is how I got mainly involved with the project. So VecCore is just uh, this abstraction layer on top of uh, VC and UME CMD libraries that were at the time. So UME CMD was developed by a PhD student, uh, Chemek Karpinski. Uh, he was at CERN. 
Um, and VC developed by Matthias Kretz is a well-known vectorization library and used in many places. It's used by root as well. So VecCore was uh, sitting on top of these and, and giving some degree of portability. So if uh, one of these libraries, uh, so even though there was a claim that ARM is supported, uh, it was difficult to compile code using these libraries directly uh, on the platform. So uh, with VecCore, there's a scalar backend, then if you use that, it's, uh, you, can, you can achieve portability and then uh, using the same interface, here I have a picture of the API. We really needed just a simple, uh, a small subset because, the, of course, the CMD instruction set is very big. There, there are many, many, especially for AVX 512, many, many different kinds of operations. But the basic blocks that we needed for our operations um, can be summarized here. And of course, we also had math mathematical functions and so on, like little extras on top of this that are not shown here. Um, and the decision to, to write this library it was based on the fact that uh, compiler and train six, they, they lock you on one uh, microarchitecture. So if I write within train six, I would be targeting SSC or AVX2 or AVX 512, not all of them at the same time. So even in the same architecture, in the same uh, x86 architecture, you don't really have portability. So uh, maybe if the length of your operations is fixed and you can optimize for, for one of these, then it's good, but uh, the lack of portability really didn't make sense to use this. For on the other side, auto vectorization, uh, you have to be very careful with the way you write the code. So the performance uh, was very variable across compilers. So even small changes can break the vectorization and then you have to look at the compiler reports to see why uh, the code doesn't vectorize anymore. So uh, in between, there was this approach using the library where you will force the, exp the vectorization explicitly but you have some degree of freedom to choose how to compile to dispatch to different backends. So then you can choose AVX, SSC, uh, and so on. And you, you get uh, like the benefits a little bit from both sides. You get a better, like easier, somewhat easier to maintain code, but uh, also some portability. And that has shown in benchmarks that we could get great performance. So in VecGeom, if you take the shape algorithms, um, you can see that the vectorized API um, is much faster than the scalar API, and even the, the scalar API in VecGeom uh, is often faster than root and gen4. And here, for historic reasons, they also use solids, but use solids in VecGeom were merged eventually. So, but of course, that only solves part of the problem because now if you want to use this vectorized API, you need to have a vector of uh, particles or of points to, to call the API. And this is where there was a big challenge to convert. So we also, of course, had VecMath. Um, so VecMath is using VecCore to implement random number generators and with success, uh, so the, there's good performance for, um, here you can see the MRG 32K3A. Uh, the performance is uh, with the CUDA backend using VecCore and QRun is almost the same. Uh, for the other two, there were some uh, different challenges because a lot of the operations couldn't be expressed because they use integers and uh, so the, back, the, the, the performance is not as good, but um, overall um, the approach works. We know that if you, we can use this uh, and get the CMD speed up that we want in the code where, where we apply it. But um, the, also you know, the focus on CMD vectorization meant that eventually the GPU particle transport prototype was discontinued during the development of GMP and, the, and all of the, also but due to manpower issues with uh, the simulation is a very complex problem. So we didn't have enough effort to maintain uh, everything going together. So, um, Converting the specific benchmarks into an overall game, 
requires, of course, restructuring the, the way the simulation works. The way Gen4 works is uh, for each thread, you pick a track and you go with that track all the way from the time the particle is created until it decays or it creates other secondaries and so on. And this creates some challenges because when you do this iteration, all of the threads are doing this at the same time, then they are trying to access a lot of memory at the same time and you're trying to run a lot of the code also at the same time. Uh, so here I create this plot of the Gen4 microarchitecture utilization on a big machine uh, from OpenLab. So this picture is for a CMS uh, run with a particle gun of 100 GeV protons and four Tesla magnetic field, 32 threads. And you can see that if you classify the instructions, the, the, the time uh, spent, you see that there's a lot of uh, uh, memory related issues and i think that you know it took us a while to realize that uh, here i have the, uh, on the bottom of the slide a picture to to make an analogy it, it doesn't matter if you have a ferrari if there are a lot of traffic lights on, on your path uh, so as by the, the, you have to access the memory and you have to wait for it then uh, you know a bicycle will do so we were sort of um, trying to optimize in an area where we couldn't see the benefit. The code was faster, but then you hit the next traffic light and then the, the speed doesn't matter that much. So in the lessons learned from the GenV, uh, we saw that uh, with GenV it was a simpler code, at least the part where we have to access all of this code at the same time. The, the main change in GenV is that we process tracks in baskets. You see that the front end bound part would do, do mainly to instruction cache misses is gone. Uh, but the memory bound part is still there. So, um, so the conclusion was that the, even though the vectorization gives us the gain on the local level of the code, uh, we still have this big challenge of how to access the data in the right patterns to hide the, the latency, to make a better use of the bandwidth of the machine and so on. So, um, but we, we had many lessons learned during the project um, and uh, we hope to apply this in the future uh, when, when writing, uh, when, when working on, on Gen4 and on the next prototypes. So uh, this is also a slide from, from that presentation with the lessons learned. But I think the key takeaway is that, uh, you know, premature optimization is the root of all evil. We, we have to really uh, for every application that we're going to port from high energy physics uh, to make use of uh, accelerators or just a new process or, or instruction set, we have to really measure, see where, where the bottleneck is and, then, um, and iterate until we can really get further along. Um, so here I have plots of uh, the performance comparison between Gen4 and Gen-V. And uh the the cost that we had is that for um to gain this uh improvement in the instruction this is we also need a lot more memory and this is a trade off that we will certainly have to make um when so if we want to parallelize on the track level and we need a lot of tracks in flight at the same time I think this will uh, is something that we cannot escape from. Um, and, and here we see also that with the number of threads, uh, the gain versus Gen4 became somewhat smaller as we scaled up because the scaling uh, Gen4, uh, even though the memory access patterns is not as uh, efficient, the scaling is very, very good. So eventually the, the slightly worse scaling of Gen V uh, caught up and uh, and the you know the 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 throughput uh, relative throughput uh, it was not as good. Um, so uh, this big focus on vectorization had some impact on the code that we have now, uh, and I think that uh, CMD is uh, complex. If it's not really the bottleneck, if we have a kernel that is doing some simple operations that is vectorizable. Um, then 
it, it is worth investing the time and writing the vectorized code. But if we have this uh, very big and complex uh, machinery to, to do the simulation, for example, then uh, it, adding this support will bring a lot of complexity. And then eventually we have to m keep maintaining it for a long time. And I think that in VecGeom, I, I have uh, placed here a couple of links to parts of the code where I think that there is more complexity than, than we should. And in part, of course, is C++, it's heavily templated. And uh, I think that this places, for example, a higher barrier for contributors trying to enter the project. And this is something that we will need. Uh, for example, if uh, people that are uh, writing software now, they have to retire, then we have new people and then they have to arrive at a very complex code and learn how it works. It's difficult. And, <coughs> excuse me, um, having um, uh, SIMD and CUDA supported together also required a lot of if devs and boilerplate code in, in VecGeom. Uh, and of course that is adds to the complexity. Uh, another thing that uh, I, I see as a problem in code that uses vectorization explicitly is that eventually some, some of the SIMD types are percolated into the public APIs. And this becomes a problem because if you compile the library for one architecture, uh, for example, if I have code in, compiled for SSC, uh, then I have to use exactly the same flags to link against it. Because if you use uh, AVX2, then it may crash because the, uh, the ABI is different. Or even uh, different compilers can have different ABIs. It becomes very sensitive. It's very difficult to, to make everything work together. It, it, more difficult to make everything work together. The other complication that happened with VecGeom was how to support RootIO. And this is, I think, this is an essential feature for software in high energy physics is to interact with RootIO. And this is uh, mainly due to SIMD types uh, used as data member in classes. So in RootIO, you can uh, stream classes in and out. But of course, if you compile something that will think that the vector in your class is three, uh, is four elements or eight elements wide, then the reading and writing of that data is also different. So um, it's not trivial to solve this problem or how, how to do root IO in a class that has this kind of data member. So I think that um, if uh, vectorization is applied to codes in the future, it really should not, uh, should not appear in any interface. It should be internal to the algorithm and, and the interface has to use some abstraction on, on, on this uh, vector that doesn't use the length like either a pointer, even though a pointer sounds like old school C, but uh, at least then the calling conventions are the same. And then internally, it doesn't matter if you're using a different kind of instruction than, than the other code, then for, you can link against and, and use the code. Think about, for example, the BLAST libraries. You can compile them for any instruction set architecture, but your code can link to it and use it uh, without a problem. So I think that we have to really dedicate uh, a lot of thought for this. There were also some other minor problems like scalar versus SIMD trade-offs. And this is like, how do you decide when to return early and when to check if all the lanes in the SIMD are uh, either false or true? Because checking the, the mask has an overhead and it can speed up the scalar code, but as your vector goes wider, like in AVX 512, if you're checking for an empty mask, the probability that it will be empty is lower and lower because you have more and more elements and they have divergent uh, runtime, like the, the divergent runtime. So then you can add this and it, you can see that it improves in, in some cases and deteriorates performance in other cases. So, and then you think, oh, should I specialize the scalar and then I have duplication of code? So. It's, it can lead to poor performance in both cases, depending on the trade-off that you choose. And uh, finally, uh, even if we manage to use AVX 512 to its full potential, then we have to come to terms with the fact that we have to run this thing on the grid. And on the grid, even, AVX, uh, even SSC 4.2 was not commonplace. In, uh, so there were machines old enough that SSC 2 was the best that could be used. So we spent a lot of time developing and optimizing for this uh, architecture. But then when it comes to take the, you know, 
get the benefit of running and taking the speed up, then uh, uh, the hardware we have to run it on doesn't support it. So I think this is another point that when we consider like, should we support AMD GPUs or NVIDIA GPUs or uh, this or that CPU is something that we have to consider. Like what is the grid going to have 10 years from now that we can target our software to, to be optimized on? So the, the focus uh, needs to be on the identification uh, of the performance benchmarks uh, via profiling. And uh, I think that unless it's very clear that SIM vectorization is going to play a big role in increasing performance, it should be relegated uh, to like a, um, second place to uh, parallelism like multi-threading and accelerators. So now that the Gen4 project, Gen V project ended, uh, we have the Gen4 R&D task force, and here is a link of the page, and we have several smaller initiatives. So that are based on the three main axes, improvement, optimization, and modernization of Gen4. Uh, so we want to measure and ident identify resource bottlenecks, uh, performance bottlenecks, and work on optimization in Gen4 to mitigate these effects. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Gen4 is complex and the low hanging fruit are all taken care of. We cannot simply make a change to a, a function here or a class there and get a big performance improvement. We really have to tackle now the big uh, structural changes to gain performance. Uh, we have some efforts in that direction. Vitek and Andre are working on having the tracks have less state so that we can go from one thread processing a, a track all the way to the end to uh, multiple threads, maybe collaborating on processing several uh, uh, tracks at once in, in lockstep so that, for example, all, all the threads are running physics at the same time and you have less of these instruction cache misses, for example. Um, so on the other fronts, we have development integration of fast simulation techniques into Gen4. So we have uh, standard uh, techniques based on GFlash, for example, and on machine learning and uh, investigation of the potential use of accelerators. And this is where we have to really rethink because here I, I put a flame graph of the simulation, uh, CMS simulation in Gen4, the same where I got that graph for the uh, memory latency. And you see that there are a lot of functions being called in it. If you think about GPUs, you want to have a small kernel, maybe a few that you run on the GPU and come back, and the GPU is then much faster than your CPU, uh, and you can take advantage of it like that. But for simulation, the entire one million something lines of code is your kernel. So you want to run everything on the GPU. And so it's a massive, uh, massively complex problem to port to the GPU, and that's why it, until now it was not done because it's really, really hard. Uh, so before we had this bottom-up approach, we started the optimizing the algorithms and trying to go up and try to orchestrate this uh, to run on differently with the John V project. Uh, right now we plan to maybe take the top-down approach. We start with simple models for physics. For geometry, we have VecGeom that works on CUDA. So, and think about how can we fit simulation on the GPU? How can we run a large portion of the simulation there? Probably not everything because of course, uh, there are many, many physics models and there's not enough manpower and time to port the whole of simulation there. But we also know like from the V efforts that uh, a lot of the time is spent on a subset of the geometry and a subset of the physics models. So can we port this part to run on the, an accelerator? And we, um, so, and also what can we learn from the graphics community? So in, now there are these cards that can do uh, real time ray tracing, which is a very similar problem. Like what can we learn from them? They managed to put this problem that has very high divergence between rays into the GPU. So it's not as complex as simulation, but I think that if we look in the literature, we can learn from them. So. One of the initiatives that we have is uh, to use ray tracing with VecGeom to 
understand how we can deal uh, with the physics and so on. So we need to build the expertise in HEP on how to use the GPU hardware for simulation. Um, of course, the, the, this requires the management of the rays and of the navigation of the geometry. We have different representation in ray tracing where everything is made up of triangles and then the triangles, you know, the intersection algorithm is made in hardware. So uh, can we transform our geometries to work in that way? Or can we uh, convert the algorithms that we have to fit uh, with uh, the interfaces that are provided for ray tracing? So we have, of course, some issues to be resolved uh, in part uh, in the VecGeom code structure, how the CUDA code relates to the CPU code. Um, but what we really need to learn is the GPU, uh, CPU communication, how to do that, how to efficiently do navigation on the GPU, locate the particles, see what the next volume is, and do that efficiently for one million particles at once, all the particles that we are transporting. Uh, th there are also some interesting libraries that we want to investigate, uh, the NVIDIA Optics that has been integrated before, I will mention in the next slide. But um, if we don't use this, how, how, how else can we access the GPU hardware ray tracing support? Uh, because I think this will be an essential part of making simulation work on the GPU. So uh, of course that uh, the picture I had in the beginning with the GPU, the number of cores in the, was almost the same, but these are not the same cores. So the evolution of the hardware is very clear. Uh, in the last few years, uh, the biggest change I think for simulation is uh, so-called independent thread scheduling. Uh, sorry, I'm not going in the order of the slide, but uh, this is really some a game changer for, for us because you can you don't have all the current all the threads in a warp going lockstep but they can be at different points of the the kernel that you call and where you have a lot of divergence um, uh, it will make a big difference in performance for simulation um, but in general the CUDA and GPU hardware are evolving so we have to follow this uh, to be able to uh, put our code on the accelerator uh, for example, one new thing that was developed was uh, CUDA supporting clean. Maybe we can leverage that, uh, for example, for analysis, for creating a kernel uh, uh, at runtime and then launching that on the GPU. Uh, for, for simulation, I'm not sure that this, uh, even though it's a very important development, would be relevant. Uh, but there are also the, the softer parts of uh, the evolution. Uh, everybody knows that works on CUDA that the, you cannot use uh, standard library. And this is a big limitation. But and NVIDIA is working on porting some parts of the C++ standard library to CUDA. And Atomic and Tech Traits are already available in the current uh, latest CUDA version. And uh, as uh, they launch new CUDA toolkits, they will add more and more. And this library is based on the, a port of libc++ from LLVM, so it's open source. Um, uh, one other thing that will be very interesting for the simulation is the CUDA graphs. So we have uh, different particle types. Uh, so we have a lot, a lot of kernels that we will have to manage in the GPU. So the CPU in this case will be just an orchestrator. Uh, so to hide the latency of uh, the transfers back and forth, of course, the first we try to run as much as possible on the GPU and send tracks and get back hits uh, to the CPU and let the track live entirely on the GPU. But also with all these kernels, we have to have some way to manage. So for each, uh, for example, particle, you could have a call graph of all the physics processes that it's going to call. And with a CUDA graph, you can bundle the dependency of, of this complex call graph and send it at once for the GPU. So if we can manage to uh, create such a call graph for the entire simulation step, then calling the GPU to do the uh, the full step for each particle type uh, can be much more easily managed in the, in, on the CPU. Uh, there are also new uh, synchronization primitives for um, allowing synchronization in just parts of the threads 
this will help uh, with managing, for example, diverse sets of tracks on the GPU. You call a big, big kernel that can do a lot of uh, the operations, but uh, between, for example, all the electrons, you can synchronize at a particular point, but not all the other particles. Um, uh, I think support for hardware ray tracing is uh, the, the key element that we will need to explore for uh, simulation on GPU. Uh, the, the next architecture, Ampere, it's about to be announced in two days from now uh, at this uh, GTC GPU technology conference. I, I plan to attend. I think uh, the, the key for them is to really remove, for gaming, the ray tracing currently gives a big performance hit and this was something that NVIDIA didn't expect. So they're focusing on ray tracing to um, allow them to sell more cars to have this uh, uh, bigger part of the chip dedicated to ray tracing. And this is something that we're very interested in exploring. So there is this uh, library, NVIDIA Optics. Uh, at CHEP last year, it was uh, presented uh, by Simon Blythe uh, code where he integrated optics and uh, NVIDIA optics into Gen4 cre to create the optics with CK uh, project for uh, speeding up uh, optical photon in neutrino detectors uh, simulation and uh, getting speed ups of about 1000 times because the in, in this case, the amount of code that ran on the GPU is very focused, just one particle type and a few processes. So uh, porting is easier and, and the, because a big portion of the code ran that, uh, that part, like the, the optical models, then it's possible to obtain a speed up. For a general simulation, it's much more difficult to, to port the entire code on the, simulation. So as I was saying, the, the particle transport and ray tracing, they have many similar uh, similarities. So if you, th you can think of the ray as our track and when you do the shading, when you hit the geometry in, in, during ray tracing, you will see what color it is, if it can hit the light and so on. Uh, but of course, the, there are also major differences. Uh, we have secondary particle, electromagnetic fields, particle going to uh, curved trajectories and, and so on. So we have many more uh, models, but the overall uh, structure of the problem is the same. So if we can convert, for example, the ray generation into a, a HEP event generation and uh, go into this framework for ray tracing, replacing the shading for the physics processes. Um, the understanding, of course, that the key is in the schedule part where we have to manage all these tracks, the variable number of them, how do they, how do we keep the events together and so on. The big challenge is in this part of the code. Uh, picking one physics model and converting uh, wouldn't be difficult, but the framework to handle all the things running at the same time is the really big challenge. So I think that if we can understand how the, in the ray tracing uh, libraries this is done, then we can uh, apply the same technique to make simulation work. Um, okay, so for uh, HPC and HEP software, it was already mentioned that Summit and Sierra, the first uh, top two supercomputers, are not x86 systems. They are IBM power. Of course, that all of the HPCs these days run Linux uh, and they all uh, have accelerators. So on the bottom left picture, you can see that NVIDIA Volta uh, is growing very quickly. Um, and this is the, these are the GPUs that have already the independent thread scheduling. So we need to learn how to use these machines to uh, be able to match the requirements that we will have for the next few years. But there's also this very interesting platform, the A64FX, 
and it's currently the top of the green 500 even though on the top 500 list it's only 179 if i'm not mistaken uh, uh, so i wanted to dedicate a slide to talk about this machine in particular uh, from here i think what we have to to think about is we cannot focus on simd vectorization on x86 because uh, if we are limited to x86 then we later cannot run on power or arm that will be available for to us uh, the fujitsu uh, a64fx is a processor specifically designed for hpc this is a link to one of the presentations uh, by um, uh, one of the uh, uh, how can i say uh, creators of the machine uh, uh, the key difference with the uh, regular CPU is that all of the memory is on chip. So there is no DRAM. If you look at a picture of the node that is uh, based on this, there are no, no DRAM slots. It's just the HBM on chip. And uh, this is uh, very interesting for high energy physics code because, or not just high energy physics code, but uh, a lot of HPC codes are now memory bound and the memory is the thing that plays the biggest role in the power budget also. Moving data from one place to another is the biggest cost in power. So here you have both very high bandwidth, similar to a GPU, that's why it has these accelerator-like properties, but also much lower latency because the distance you're traveling to access the memory is much shorter. Um, of course, that is not as relevant for us that uh, the it has uh, this scalable vector extensions from ARM. It supports up to 512-bit uh, CMD instructions. Um, but I think that if we have all this code for which the bottleneck is the memory access, uh, the target for this machine was to increase 100 times the performance relative to the K supercomputer in Japan. So that's why it's supposed K. And they so apologies for interrupting you, but uh, you have just a couple of minutes to wrap up so that we have enough time for the discussion. Okay, yeah, I, the next slide is the last. I'm almost Good. done. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Um, so, um, sorry, so since we, the, so they have the target of 100x speed up without changing the code, but in hardware innovation. And this uh, from the presentations has been largely achieved. Uh, so for this Poisson equation solver, they have shown that one of these CPUs could beat uh, two CPUs, two Intel Platinum CPUs. And Fujitsu, uh, the company that developed the chip, also uh, started the contract with Cray to sell the supercomputers. So for my final thoughts, um, we, uh, I think that maintainability for long-term support and sustainability of the code um, should be take precedence over uh, supporting specific hardware features. Um, so we don't want to lock ourselves out or put us in a place where the have to rewrite the code again. Um, so we cannot ignore uh, architectures other than x86 because uh, in the future, maybe ARM and PowerPC will play a much bigger role than they're playing now. For example, it was mentioned before the clouds from Google and Amazon. Amazon now has uh, the Graviton 2 chip that has uh, many cores on ARM and is also very competitive uh, performance-wise with the Intel Xeon. Um, but also we can maybe avoid some in-house development and push this uh, problem to somebody else, and this is a, a you know uh, indication for the next talk. Uh, so if you write your code with a library, then they will deal with the portability issue, and then you can keep your code uh, uh, much more um, uh, abstract. Um, so accelerators are in rapid ascension. We need to really rethink, for, at least for simulation, we have to have a very big. Uh, uh, rethink of the entire code to be able to move to GPUs because there is no small part that we can uh, port and get a big improvement in performance. 
Um, so hard revolution moving beyond uh, Moore's law to improve performance means uh, we uh, can we uh, be saved again, right? From this uh, A64FX, if we have more of these accelerators, uh, in the last link here, I linked uh, to another similar many core microprocessor, Zeta Scalar. Uh, so we should try to see how our code performs in, in these uh, new architectures and maybe without many big architectural changes to our hardware we can use maybe a smaller farm of these specialized cores to get a big part of the game that we need for the next uh, phase of the high luminosity lhc uh, the fugaku the prototype based on the a64 fx is already uh, running this year so it started last year and this year it's running. And yes, this is all I had. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for the talk, a virtual club. <laughs> and, um, so because we're running out of time and uh, I believe that the, I don't think we can go much further than 6.30 in certain time. Uh, I would suggest that the, we go over some of the comments and uh, some of us have done some selection of what we want to cover now, what we want to postpone. So if you could uh, uh, read the comment in the live notes and then have uh, your take or a quick take after that, would that work for you? Do you know yes. where the live notes are? Uh, yes. Sorry, it's not the pre-workshop notebook. No, it's, we've now gone to the live notes, so I will uh, post it again on the full chat. Everyone meeting. Okay, live notes. Yeah. And then okay, I see I that it. John has raised his hand, so if you can add this to the end of the live, add your question or comment at the end of the live notes, and we see if we have if we have time or if we want to postpone it. Thanks. So the one in bold are the ones that we can, we have time to cover now. Okay. Um, are there hidden costs in offloading computation to accelerators in hybrid code that runs part on CPU and part on GPU? And is there some kind of threshold to make offloading convenient? Um, the model that we uh, want to have is that the CPU is a big orchestrator uh, and is calling uh, uh, asynchronously many different parts of the code that run on the CPU concurrently. So uh, in, in this way, even though you have this communication cost, it's hidden because you, for example, let's say that you're doing one step, one full step on the GPU at a time for the different particles. So then you can have, uh, you send the entire call graph for electrons and there's another thread on the, on the CPU that is sending the same call graph for muons. And another part of the CPU is receiving this uh, memory back and dealing with the hits. Uh, also consolidating new cr newly created tracks and sending back another piece to the GPU. So I think that they ca they the CPU and the GPU have to work uh, together, uh, like run the mo most of the, the code on the GPU, but hiding as much as possible of uh, this uh, communication cost by running many things concurrently. Uh, okay. Thanks. I hope that this answers the, the question. On the final thought slide, hardware evolution, save us again. I think for the initial um, high luminosity time frame. The answer is no. The HPCs that will be running in that era have been specced now, so those will have to be supported, even if if a sixty four FX machines or whatever become available. Uh, yeah. So um, so the comments about ray tracing scare me. For example, I think those are not going to be in large machines in the near future. Okay, so just uh, let me address the ray tracing first, because these this, uh, cards, uh, even though, for example, the V100s are not uh, 
supported in hardware to, to do the ray tracing, the, um, uh, they are also capable to do the same thing in software. So it doesn't mean that if we target uh, using the hardware for ray tracing, that uh, if you use one generation older or two generations older, your code is simply not going to run. It's supported, but the part that is done in hardware in the newer architecture is done in software in the older architecture. So, of course, that if we develop simulation code based on, on this technology, we have to ensure that using the software um, version of ray tracing is not going to deteriorate performance enough that it would, be, uh, it would not be uh, good. And as for the A64 effects, I think that... Uh, Okay, I don't know if uh, in 10 years there will not be a machine that we can use with X64 effects, but the first machine is coming online this year. So uh, if it's commercially available from Cray, it, there is the hope that more machines based on, on this technology will exist by the time that we start. And maybe at a smaller scale, we could have uh, you know targeted machines that do just uh, simulation, for example. Of course, that uh, we have also the different kinds of code for reconstruction and for um, uh, analysis, but uh, if at least, uh, so if these codes are capable of running on the currently existing GPUs, uh, we can separate the full CPU budget by machine and use for example, machines that are more suitable for simulation to, to just, just to run just simulation. I don't know if that uh, maybe you want to comment on my answer, if that is satisfactory. No, no, that 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 was great. Thank you. In the interest of time, we should uh, keep going. Okay. Um, sorry, there are several questions. I don't know which one to address. Is ray tracing feasible for curved trajectories uh, from charged particles? Um, of course, that is different. So uh, even with ray tracing hardware, there are, for example, people using uh, investigating different ways to exploit the hardware uh, for other tasks, for example, rendering. Um, the way we can use the ray tracing hardware is we have a step. So you have the beginning and the end point of the step, and this is a short segment. Um, uh, of course, that for neutral particles, you can just query in a straight line if it will hit the geometry or not. But you can also use the short segment to see if that short segment will intersect any surface of the detector so that you have to change the material, or if that segment is contained within the volume, and then you can go and do the physics processes. So, uh, even if we have the curved trajectories, we can exploit the, the ray tracing capabilities of the hardware in part. The, at least the geometry traversal we can exploit, not the triangle uh, intersection algorithms for now, because our geometry is there based on, on CSG and not triangles. But the key is the navigation that, that, that is done in hardware. So you have this big structure of bounding boxes, and then you have this short segment that you want to test against the geometry that you have that is very complex. And you can, if you have a million segments and you want to test them all against the geometry at the same time, this hardware support for going through the bounding boxes and figuring out if your segment intersects the geometry is the key that, that we want to use for uh, performance and simulation. I understand that, but are the segments straight in your simulation or are they, or can they be curved? Well, when you go for one step, they are straight. You have, okay, thank of you. course, in, in Gen 4, uh, the Sajita, you have the limit, but um, I, I, I think that one of the uh, people more experienced than me can comment, but I think even Gen 4 right now, for the short step, we'll check with a straight line against the geometry. Okay, thanks. Then it certainly makes sense to try acceleration. So I understand that the particle transport part is now available in CUDA, which is great. What is the main technical difficulty in compiling also some physics model with CUDA? Um, so, uh, 
the complexity is in managing um, the result of the physics. So of course that if you have a ray and it hits a surface and then you just vary what color it should be in return is one thing. But if, when your ray hits the surface, even in ray tracing, you can have this complexity. So if you have a lot of shadow rays, if you have uh, subsurface scattering or volume rendering like of fog, your ray as it's going, even if it doesn't hit any geometry, it needs to account for some interaction. And of course, in, in ray tracing, the interaction, you just change the state of uh, the, the image you're rendering. But in physics, you know, your interaction might be, you have a photon that will create an electron positron pair. Uh, how, how do you manage these two things? Do you send them back to the CPU, uh, put them in different queues and then send them back to the GPU? Is there a way to just keep them on the GPU and dynamically push them to a stack already existing on the device? These are the things that we have to learn uh, how to deal with to put the simulation on the GPU. The orchestration of the, the whole thing. Uh, once you have one physics model and uh, a complex geometry or a few couple of physics models, adding more physics models is not the challenge because you know your cross sections, you can, you can calculate the cross sections, uh, access them, but uh, how do you deal with the secondaries? This is the, the complex thing to learn how to do. And we need to build the expertise to learn how to do that. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you from me as well for answering. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think uh, for the moment we have postponed a few of the comments and discussions to tomorrow and Wednesday's discussions so that uh, if you have time to join, you can also chime in there. But I would suggest that now because we are technically end of the session, but we still have one talk that we go to uh, the, the next